for accommodating others who do not pose a threat to its very existence. Mr. Anas, let's build on this opening by J. Sai Deepak. The RSX and other spokespeople expect citizens from other denominations to describe themselves as Hindus. Dharma is, of course, identified very closely with Hinduness, they say, which they say is a function of Bharatiyata. Now, how does one apply it in the context of a multi-religious society such as ours? Uh, see, my understanding of Bharatiyata, or Dharm even for that matter, has always been what I was taught as a kid in the school, Anekta Me Ekta. We were the country, we were very upset about this. That we are different from different religions, different religions, different religions, different religions, different religions, different religions. But we were one, one country was ours, one country was ours, we were saying it. And for me, it was just one thing for me, the issue of religion. Jai Sai Deepak said that Hindu dharm is defined by what is the dharm of the dharm. I don't keep a little different from it, in a certain way. I have to say that when we decide that we are seeing this, it will be like this. It will be a secular country, it will be a country where everyone will be together, where everyone will be together, where everyone will be together. Today, जब आप नागरिकता पे और मैं ये नहीं कहता हूँ कि जैसे एक बहुत ज़्यादा प्रेवलेंट आर्गुमेंट है आर्टिकल 14 को लेके मैं वो आर्गुमेंट ही नहीं लेता हूँ मैं मानता हूँ कि हाँ आर्गुमेंट आर्टिकल 14 से इंडियंस के लिए है सिर्फ सिटिजेंस के लिए मैं वो नहीं कहता हूँ लेकिन जब आप पूरा उसका बेस बना देते हैं धर्म को तो आपको ये देखना पड़ेगा कि डेमोक्रेसी जो खुद अपने आप में एक वेस्टर्न कंस्ट्रक्ट है लेकिन हम उसको ले चल रहे हैं और इतने उस पर गर्व कर रहे हैं उसमें कि कौन से और ऐसा डेमोक्रेटिक या सेक्युलर देश है जहाँ पे धर्म के बेसिस पे सिटिजनशिप दी जा रही है और सिटिजनशिप एक वो राइट है जो आप वापस नहीं छीन सकते हो एक बार आप दे देते हो तो छीन नहीं सकते हो तो हमें किसको दे रहे हैं कैसे दे रहे हैं इस पे विचार करने की बहुत ज़्यादा आवश्यकता है सो दिस इज इंटरेस्टिंग बिकॉज हिज डेफिनेशन ऑफ भारतीयता इज यूनिटी इन डाइवर्सिटी डिराइव फ्रॉम दैट now, you know, with the government that is identified with Hindutva, many are wary of, you know, outcomes such as these. I think he's referring without naming CA. it to the CA. Correct. So how does one now reconcile the objectives of the CAA with the larger construct of the civilization, of the constitution as it stands? See, interestingly, both of us are just coming back from the Chief Justice's court. <laughs> That's why both of us are trying to, let's say, channel those arguments. So you didn't finish your arguments no, then? No, it's you listed for April 9th, in fact. <laughs> so we are on the opposite side in that matter. So I don't see why this has got to do with CA. But in any case, I'll try and address this. Just so that uh, I answer your question to him in a slightly different fashion, I disagree with the RSS definition of Hinduism and Hindutva completely. At least on their attempts to say that everybody who is born in this country is a Hindu. I don't think that needs to be said. I don't think someone who is a Muslim or a Christian uh, needs to be expected to embrace the definition of Hindu in that sense because there are two problems with that approach. One, it dilutes the definition of Hindu dharma for the followers of dharma themselves. And second, it foists that concept on those who are not followers of the dharma in that sense. You don't need to do that. According to me, good fences make good neighbors, period. You don't need to actually start this interfaith dialogue and look for equality and let's say similarity and everything. That is not even necessary. The point is very simple. When you speak of unity and diversity, Bharat traces that very value precisely from Hindu dharma because Hindu dharma is ultimately an agglomeration of multiple faith systems within itself. Several denominations subscribe to those points of view which may not actually find a point of convergence in that particular sense. The Vaishnavite may ultimately see Vishnu as the supreme being. The Shaivite may ultimately see Shiva as the supreme being. The Shakta might see Shakti as the supreme being or Devi as the supreme being. For each of them, you can think of them as monotheism in silos, but it's a polytheistic pantheon in that particular sense. So unity and diversity, as far as Bharat is concerned, cannot have learned it from anybody else except Hindu Dharma, at least in the history of the subcontinent, so to speak. So on that, I don't think there is a difference of view between Mr. Tanvir and me. There is a clear difference of view in the attempts on the part of, let's say, certain sections of certain cultural organizations to dilute the definition. Now, should we go to the argument of the CAA? 
I will just limit it to this because ultimately this matter has to be contested before the court of law, the Chief Justice's court on April 9th, which is the next date. The point is, I don't think that piece of legislation is meant to threaten anybody who lives here as a legitimate citizen of the country, regardless of their faith. Two, I don't think the definition of CAA or the way it is, or the way it is being included as a, as a humanitarian intervention as part of the Citizenship Act has anything to do with the topic here. So let me stick to the topic here. The point is, Bharatiyata ultimately means that your points of loyalty, your points of allegiance are not extraterritorial and that you choose loyalty to Bharat more than anything else. Now that is easy as far as adherence of Hindu dharma is concerned simply because their sacred spaces are here. But if you happen to follow a certain faith system, I'm not saying that it is impossible for a non-Hindu to be loyal to Bharat. I don't think that statement can be made at all in light of the kind of examples that we have had right from Sri Arif Muhammad Khan of today to Abdul Kalam of, of the past. So I don't think those examples are valid. Those who are able to reconcile their faith, which have emanated from other parts of the world, and their loyalty to Bharat, according to me, are fully capable of subscribing to the concept of Bharatiyata. I am not going to use religion as the sole and the primary filter to exclude people from the pale of Bharatiyata. I'm saying those who are able to strike that balance will obviously fall within the definition. Those who think that their personal identity from a religious point of view is at loggerheads with Bharatiyata would have made the decision anyways. I'm just hoping that since we are told that there is an Indian brand of certain foreign systems or foreign faith systems, there truly exists such Indian brands which is different from the brands that is followed in our immediate neighborhood. That's all I can say. But this concept of, let's say, let's flip the word, diversity and unity. How does the CA take that forward? I know that you wanted to sort of disconnect the conversation yeah, from yeah, Bharatiyata, but this government claims that it is actually the one that speaks for a, the essence of Bharatiyata. Right. And it talks about a Hinduness, right. which it traces to right. a dharmic past. But if that CA is going to be, or the dharma is going to sort of, at some level or the other, bring out an exposition like the CA, then we have a problem. So, see, let's have this conversation on the anvils of specifics. Is there any amendment to the existing Citizenship Act which precludes the possibility of non-Hindu applicants to knock at the doors of Bharat for citizenship or asylum? The answer is a no. The CAA is a limited inclusive intervention for the purposes of addressing the unfortunate realities of our immediate neighborhood where three Islamic republics have a specific problem with other identities. That's the unfortunate reality. And we're operating under the premise that Indian Islam is different from the brands of Islam being subscribed to by our neighbors, okay? Therefore, those people who are getting the rough end of the stick thanks to their minority position in those countries are being given a certain expedited option because the first point of attack when it comes to these countries, happens to be those people who do not share the faith of the majority in those countries. Therefore, since they are the first points of attack, they are the softest targets possible, a limited intervention is being made. The myth that is being purveyed is that CAA translates to automatic vestation of citizenship. It doesn't, because they still have to satisfy the rules that have been notified. Second, all it does is that it limits a certain cutoff period from 11 years to six years. Two, my own criticism of the CAA, despite me supporting it in principle, is the cutoff date that has been prescribed, which ultimately translates to defeating the very humanitarian intention, which is supposed to be the basis for the CAA. What is the point of limiting it to a particular date? Regardless of that, my argument still remains, I welcome it because it doesn't take away anybody else's rights. It only makes sure that those people who are being kicked out are being welcomed as soon as possible. My criticism has also been the delayed notification of the rules. So because I am not the mouthpiece for any cultural or political outfit, I am at some liberty to criticize the proponents of the CAA themselves for the delay that they have caused after taking eight different extensions from the parliament in the notification of the rules themselves. So according to me, it's important to dehyphenate these positions from any political organization or a cultural organization, because dare I say this, 
a lot of us are practicing Hindus, not because of a political party or because of a cultural organization, but because we have always been practicing Hindus. Their existence or absence wouldn't have made a difference to our practice in any case. So Anas, then what's the problem? He's saying that, look, it's only fast-tracking, it's not denying. You can still come in if you're Muslims, if you're persecuted in various countries, in any country, you can still come here and seek refuge. See, to that extent, he's right. I'm, I'm also not denying that. It's not even fast-tracking, let me tell you. The purpose stands defeated as of now. Because for, for to, to take the advantage of CAA, the cutoff is December 2014, and you have to be in India five years prior, that is 2009. Now that would have fast-tracked to six years instead of 12 years. We are in 2024, 10 years since 2014. It's already redundant. It doesn't help anyone. CAA neither helps anyone, it actually does create problem for those who are left out of NRC in Assam. Only particularly to Assam, it does create problem for them and I will expound on that. But about the rest of the other things that Dharam and uh, saying ki, you know, ek, uh, I don't know if you guys remember there was this series called Panchayat. A very famous dialogue from that ki dekh raha hai binod, angrezi mein bol bol ke kaisa baad ghuma rahe hai. So this is the same thing, that in English, what was the purpose of saying in English? What did my brother say? That if Hindus will come, then it will be easier to be a Hindu. You are reading a daily news from Rajasthan, from Lakhnao, from every place. Hindus are Hindus who have our agencies arrested for giving us ISI. So, any religious denomination, any religious denomination, you can give a blanket that you are a Hindu, if you are Hindu, then you will be good. This doesn't make sense to this. ठीक है वो तो फैलीजेंस तो सभी को लेनी है लेकिन इस बात का कोई सेंस नहीं बनता यानी इससे बेतुकी की बात तो मैंने सुनी है। But reasonable classifications have been used. Reasonable classification by many countries. Let's talk about Hindu. What about the Tamil Hindus from Sri Lanka? What about the Buddhist from China and other places? For example, I mean, we have a so, why did you leave them? You didn't have to take them. And I understand that you have policies for Tamils. You have given them that, but you didn't have to give them citizenship. You didn't give them refugee, you didn't give them citizenship. So, you didn't do anything with Hindu, you didn't leave them too. The other thing, I said, there is no correlation from my CA. It doesn't affect me, it doesn't affect me at all. My citizenship is safe in and safe and secure. Because the other thing, 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 वो भी नेचुरलाइजेशन के लिए अप्लाई कर सकते हैं उसमें से लेकिन अगर अब सीए के तहत अगर उनको करना पड़े मैं ये नहीं कहूँ उनको सिर्फ इसी के तहत करना है लेकिन अगर करना पड़े तो दो लाख जिसे आसाम में ज्योतिबादी कहते हैं जो हमेशा अपने को आसमीज कहते रहे हैं कि अपने को इंडिजिनियस कहते हैं वो भी तो बाहर हैं क्या वो खुद को पहले बांग्लादेशी प्रूफ करेंगे हिंदुस्तानी कहलाने के लिए it can be a very absurd thing that for the Hindustani, for the Hindustan's citizenship, for the naturalization, we have to prove it in Bangladesh. Okay. I'll try and make sense of the garbled argument presented here and see if I can unpack a few layers from the garbled argument. Yes. Okay. So first, see here's the point. Yeah. Ever since the end of the LTTE, situation has normalized to such an extent that Tamil Sri Lankans, are not being forced to flee that country, that is a fact. The fact of the matter is, if Bharat had an equation or at least the ability to pressurize Pakistan, Bangladesh and Afghanistan to the extent that they could treat their Hindu minorities with some degree of dignity, then the CAA would actually be irrelevant and unnecessary. Because ultimately, it's a question of what is your relationship with those countries, what is the treatment of those populations by their native governments. Today, nobody can accuse the Sri Lankan government of meeting out the same treatment to Tamil Sri Lankans the way Hindus of Pakistan are being given treatment by Pakistan, Bangladesh, or Afghanistan, so to speak, in those countries. So if you can ensure that they can stay in their own countries without creating any further trouble for themselves or for us, we would want them to stay there. So therefore, the entire argument is this, that Bharat must effectively apply an open dharamshala policy in the name of the CAA, and the CA is unconstitutional precisely because it doesn't open its doors to every persecuted community under the sun. Frankly speaking, this makes a mockery of the concept of sovereignty 
and our own borders and our own sovereign interest and security interest. I have no reason to trust a Muslim from Pakistan, Afghanistan or Bangladesh, period. Because ultimately a choice was made and therefore I will certainly view them with a certain degree of suspicion, a heightened degree of suspicion compared to people coming from the Hindu community in those states. That's a but fact. But the Hindus There's in Pakistan an... stayed back in no, here's, Pakistan. Here's the funny part. The Hindus here's in Pakistan part. stayed back their in Pakistan. Entire argument is, their entire <laughs> argument is, the Hindus of Pakistan stayed back. Why? Here's the point. When Pakistan was created, the question was, how do we divide land for this area called Pakistan? So the existing population of Muslims in this country in undivided Bharat was taken into account based on the 1946 elections, and then the area was divided. Despite 90% of the population of Muslim community before 1946 voting for the state of Pakistan, the bulk of them stayed that's, back. That's wrong. That's a fact. It's a fact. It's, it's a not documented a fact. fact. You don't fact. get to actually deny these facts. It is out of so context. Today we are being it, told, it, it loses in We are being told everybody who stayed back stayed back for purposes of patriotism. Sorry, 1946 elections proved whose allegiance were where. Secondly, here's the important thing. The Hindus of so Pakistan. So you're talking about the 1946 yes, elections saying, and Hindus the results back there? in the Muslim provinces yes. where a large number of Muslims yes. voted for I'll no. it's like this. Muslim Assume for a moment you yeah. have a six bedroom house. Yes. Out of that one portion of the family says we are X number of people, we need 50% of the house. Ultimately, only two people shift to that portion of the family, that portion of the house which has been given for 50% of the family, the rest of them stay back. Now, because we are constantly told that Dr. Ambedkar is the framer of the constitution and we are expected to constantly count out to him. Why would Dr. Ambedkar speak of a complete exchange of populations after 1946 and after the elections if he wasn't aware of the ground reality when he was actually part of the drafting committee of the constitution? So why is it that Ambedkar is selectively quoted and cited in other contexts? Why don't we quote him in this context? What did he say in his book, Pakistan and the Partition of Bharat? What did he say with respect to the reasons for population change? Why did he actually bat so vociferously for population exchange more than even Madan Mohan Malviya for that matter? Madan Mohan Malviya is the founder of the Banaras Hindu University in 1916. These are all people who were participants in the Sangathan movement. The one who openly wrote a book asking for exchange of the Muslim population of Bharat with the Hindu population of undivided Pakistan, so to speak, was Dr. Ambedkar. What is their response to that? So if you have a problem with this argument, go ahead, call Dr. Ambedkar and Islamophobe. We'll see what happens after that. No, no, I, I will not do that. I will not do that. Well, no, but the, anyway, caste is a but western construct, like my friend said earlier. Fundamentally, there was a whole movement, as you know. I, I, let me put nuance to what he said. No, they'll blame who, the two-nation theory on Savarkar and they'll leave like, Sayyidah Mathkan out of the picture. Okay. That's the traditional See, argument. When a man Go loses patience to okay. listen, I know I have yes, one. Yeah, make yeah, it, okay. Of course you have one. <laughs> no, no, please. please. <laughs> First of all, uh, yeah. uh, see, this is what I learned during my days in debating. If a man attacks, see, this is the problem. This is the problem. We started with Bhatiyata. We started with Dharma. It ended up coming to Muslim from Pakistan. Like every single time. Is that Dharma? What about your own existence? Why are you not proud of that? I come from Banaras. Sanskrit, uh, Sankat Mochan Mandir ke Pangar mein khela hoon mein. Main musalman hoon, main paach vakka namazi hoon, main isak roze se hoon. Gyanwapi wapas de di jiji. Thik hai, lekin main woh bharat ko represent no, karta hoon. Did you hear what he said? Gyanwapi wapas de di jiji. Gyanwapi wapas de di jiji. Gyanwapi pe chal la hai. Mathura wapas de di jiji. Aap sab le li jiji. Adai Chopra wapas de di jiji. Dekhye. Adhiyana Masjid wapas de di jiji. 40,000 places, give it all back. I'm sure Banaras mein aap ne easy saan. Yeh mein jiji chuka hoon. ये मैं जी चुका हूं यहां हो गई तकलीफ अब आप सुनिए मैं उसकी बात करता हूं 1946 की 1946 में इन्होंने कहा कि दो चार लोगों ने वोट दिया दो गए भाई वोट का अधिकार कितनों को मिला था आपने उस टाइम पे भी अंग्रेजों ने ही दिया था जो दया भाव था या हम जीते थे जो कह लो पाकिस्तान हमेशा ये कहा जाता है अलीगढ़ के लॉन्डो की बदमाशी है ये तो ये वही था पाकिस्तान तो अलीगढ़ के लॉन्डो की बदमाशी था उन्हीं को तो आपने अधिकार दिया था वोट का हम जैसे चलो हमारे भी रहा होगा हमारे ठीक ठाक घर से आता हूं मैं लेकिन बाकी जो गरीब थे वो थे उनको अधिकार नहीं मिला था औरतों का अधिकार नहीं मिला था एक तबके को मिला था वो तबका पाकिस्तान चला गया उसको वहां पे बहुत जमीन मिली है वो बहुत अमीरी से क्योंकि पाकिस्तान ने तो अपना जिम्मेदारी एबोल्यूशन भी नहीं किया तो इन लोग के पास जमीन वमीन है वो वहां खुश है हम आज तक उनका झेल रहे हैं हमसे तो कोई मतलब ही नहीं था हमारे पास तो वोट था ही नहीं तो अगर वो इतने हम पे उसका इल्जाम क्यों है? 
And if they now find that the idea is not a good one, in fact, they are getting actually discriminated because of who they are in Pakistan, then it's not our responsibility to rehabilitate this Pakistan's problem. It is not our responsibility for Hindus also. Sovereignty ki baat hoi thi na, apne border ki baat hoi thi. Hindustan ki baat hoti hai, to Hindustan ke logo ki baat hoti hai. Aap citizenship naturalization ka aapke paas pura process tha. Bada saal mein pura hota tha, ek bohat achcha develop kiya tha. Parliament ke paas wo right tha. Parliament paas aaj bhi wo right hai. Bada saal mein milta hai ki aap yaha pe gyaara saal Hindustan mein rahe, ek saal aap pe lagata rahe, ya to aap Hindustan mein rahe hai, ya Hindustan ke sarkar ki aapne seva ki hai. इसमें क्या बुराई थी? खैर आपने कहा चलो हम एक्सपेडाइट करेंगे एक्सपेडाइट भी नहीं हो रहा है। Respond to that इसमें क्या बुराई थी? This is just a political. Hindustan he is just saying Hindustan has no civilizational obligation to the Hindus of Pakistan. Fair enough. That's what he keeps saying. Twelve times he just dropped the word Hindustan. Second, Aligarh के लॉन्डोंग की जो आयाशी है वो भारत पे बहुत भारी पड़ी। Okay बहुत भारी पड़ी। Millions of people lost their lives. Millions of women were raped and paraded naked. And this is dismissed as Aligarh ke London ki ayashi. How insensitive to the people have actually done this? That's the funny part. This is the funny part. That's 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 the funny part. So then on the questions start getting addressed. The constant assembly starts, it's, it's formulated in August 1946. Subsequently, once the conversations start, we actually keep a few seats open in the hope that Pakistan doesn't become a reality. That is the extent to which we went. When we realized this is not going to happen, we switched the conversation to ask the question, what do we do to those people who are being held hostage? Because the history of this period will show that Pakistan decided to use the non-Muslim population of that particular area as a hostage population to negotiate with Bharat. The entire basis for the nehru liaquat Pact ultimately was this. Let's assume for a moment that we don't owe an obligation to the Hindus of Pakistan and Pakistan doesn't have a duty with respect to Muslims of India. Why did the fount of everything that's great in this country, Sri Japandir Jawaharlal Nehru, choose to enter into a nehru liaquat Pact where both of us are assuring the other with respect to the safety of religious minorities in their country? What is this basis then? Ultimately, at the political level and at the constitutional level, we have accepted that we have a civilizational duty towards these minorities. Anas, this is documented point. fact. Okay. That is that's a very valid, valid point. point. Uh, see, I'm, not ho I'm neither holding brief for Nehru, nor I'm no, holding no, no, brief for Pakistan. Please answer the specific question. Forget but about I, holding a brief. I completely agree with that. At that point, so Nehru... So we are now executing that civilizational I, brief. No, no, no. Allow me. The civilization... Nehru Liyakat Pact, what did it say? It said that, brother, you do it from your own side. We will do it from our own side. It's going to be there, it's going to be there, it's going to be there, it's going to be there. You can put pressure on international forums. Hindustan is very strong. We have beaten Pakistan very much, brother. What are you talking about? We are winning every war. We are in diplomacy. We are in every war. We are a mother of democracy. You talk about the spirit. The spirit of the agreement gave both the countries a say in the welfare of the religious minorities right. across each other's borders. Right. Because of our history. Unfortunately, in Pakistan, they broke that contract, that agreement. Now we fear for the future of the religious minorities, the Hindus, the Sikhs, the Christians, the Agreed. Buddhists, the Jains, and uh, the others. Christians so also. they say, where are the Jews? The there was only one Jew, according to the census of Pakistan. Huh? Yeah. <laughs> so they're saying that Jews are not in question. Jews. That's so, not so, the so point. So here's the point. If you read Articles 5 to 11 of the Constitution, that is entirely Pakistan-centric when you're defining citizenship as part of your own constitution because you realize that there's a continuing cord that connects you with the people there. It also speaks of how many people can go there when you come back, what happens to your citizenship, so on and so forth. So in the backdrop of your specific history of the subcontinent, considering the basis for the partition, for us to say we owe no obligations whatsoever, despite the nehru liaquat Pact, according to me, is to make an argument in vacuum when there are clear documented facts to the contrary. Look, I get See, the sense. Ma 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 Can I ask a provocative question? But I'm very thankful to my friend here. He knows that I'm fasting and I can't speak much, so he's doing the, okay, all right. the speaking. Okay, you're fasting. No, you're fasting. Harman Ji is fasting. <laughs> but he, I'm just, I'm being thankful to you. Why are you getting agitated? I'm just being thankful to you. Don't get so angry. You need not be so angry. We are very angry. What happened? Calm down. It's good, sir. 
अब मैं आता हूँ उस बात पे मैंने कहा मेरा सी ए से कोई कॉलेज नहीं मैंने शुरू में ही कहा था मैं फिर से वापस आ रहा मेरा कॉलेज क्यों होगा थोड़ा सा है वो है अनकॉन्स्टिट्यूशनैलिटी पे मैं संविधान को मानता हूँ मैं संविधान के अगर कोई चीज अनुरूप नहीं है कोई कानून तो वो गलत है टेज ऑफ The That's CA, true. I cannot. Article 15 says there cannot be a discrimination on the basis of race, religion, caste, I'll gender, so on and so forth. I'll one, answer the question. One, one, one minute, twenty seconds. The problem with this argument is that a Pakistani Hindu refugee who has come through a legitimate refugee channel is being equal, equated with a Bangladeshi Muslim immigrant who has come through the illegal channel as part of this particular I'm definition. I'm talking about in, born Therefore, in India. Therefore, when Pakistani Hindu I'm refugees, I'm talking about Indians. I'm not exactly even talking about Pakistani. A Pakistani Hindu refugee and an Indian parent, so to speak, when they combine, you're actually it's a marriage between an Indian citizen and a refugee within Bharat, which is recognized by an Indian law, but. When an illegal migrant wants to marry a citizen, that is not the same as a refugee marrying a citizen. That's point number one. Two, since we are constantly being told equal treatment, we should be concerned about the people here. We should always think about only the people here. What is my friend's position on the Uniform Civil Code? See this obsession? No, no. I, I no, it's not an obsession. No, it's no, a no, legitimate no. See, question. See, jumping. Gan vapi de do. Ye kar do. You see, it's a matter of constitutional. It's a matter of constitutional. Some vidhan ke pe. I raise a constitutional point of law. You did not respond, Mr. Anas. Let's not change the goalposts. He asked you a valid question. We've got twenty seconds. I'm asking you. The Constitution itself says we should give up. Give ourselves a uniform civil code. The Supreme no, Court itself. No, it is part of DPSP. Yes, yes, it is not yes, part sir. of fundamental right. First, sir, let enforced. me realize my fundamental rights. That is my the sir, priority. Sir, it is an objective of the Constitution of no, India. No, no, fundamental As rights are the priority. Of, First, give sir, me that. It is a directive principle. You aspire towards that. The state aspires for it that. It is. It is an ideal that we must aspire to, as the Constitution also upholds many other ideals to aspire to. No, no, not time. I, I, you, no, I, I, you won't give me time to respond, and you please have... go ahead. One minute. See, no, you haven't even raised a question. What, what will I respond? No, I've asked you. I said, <laughs> how are you saying that this is a See, UCC is part of DPSP? I'm fighting for fundamental rights. 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 Those Preserve exceptions our can stay in religious freedoms, freedoms and UCC give us the ability to oppose anybody else who is being actually right affected in Pakistan. Hai. That's the simple argument. Article 12, which is okay. part of fundamental right, protects my personal right. Okay, gentlemen, you know I didn't anticipate such passion, but we we find that <laughs> no, but but look, at least debate is alive in this country. So tell all those people out there. that we can debate without fear or favor even the trickiest issues in india today i leave it to this thank you very much ek ye bahut headline story rahi उद्धव ठाकरे का एक बयान मैं वो मराठी में बयान है वो मैं आपको सुनवाता हूं और आपसे उसका रिएक्शन लेता हूं उद्धव ठाकरे ने आपके बारे में आपके विषय पे क्या बोला आइए एक बार सुन लेते हैं उद्धव उद्धव ठाकरे की का बयान युति मध्य जे मेहनत करो तो नितिन गडकरी चाहिए नहीं नितिन जी सोडन दिया भाजपा रा उ महाविकास आघाड़ी कड़ी तुम्हारा निवड़ो दाखवा महाराष्ट्र पानी दाखवा महाराष्ट्र की धमक दाखवा महाराष्ट्र दिल्ली समोर कभी झुकला नहीं जी कह रहे हैं कि आइए आप हम आपको एम से टिकट दे देंगे महाराष्ट्र दिल्ली के आगे कभी झुकता नहीं है देखिए पहली बात तो यह है जी कि पार्लियामेंट्री बोर्ड की जब मीटिंग हुई तो महारा तो मध्य मध्य प्रदेश गुजरात 
और उत्तर प्रदेश के पदाधिकारियों के साथ चर्चाओं के निर्णय होगा अब मैं महाराष्ट्र से लड़ता हूँ तो मेरे महाराष्ट्र के प्रदेश के पदाधिकारी आकर उनसे चर्चा ही नहीं हुई थी तो पहले लिस्ट में स्वाभाविक रूप से मेरा नाम आने की संभावना नहीं थी जी अब दूसरे लिस्ट में नाम आया मैं भारतीय जनता पार्टी का कार्यकर्ता हूँ लड़ूंगा तो भारतीय जनता पार्टी से ही लड़ूंगा दूसरे कोई पार्टी में जाने का सवाल ही नहीं उठता और इस प्रकार की ऑफर भी हास्यास्पद है क्योंकि मैं अपने पार्टी के साथ जुड़ा हूँ विचारधारा के साथ जुड़ा हूँ इसी पार्टी में रहूंगा और इसी पार्टी में काम करूंगा नितिन गडकरी मेरे साथ है केंद्रीय मंत्री हैं भारतीय जनता पार्टी के पूर्व राष्ट्रीय अध्यक्ष रहे हैं नितिन जी आपका अभिनंदन है तो जोरदार तालियों के साथ अभिनंदन करिए नितिन गडकरी का नितिन जी अटल बिहारी वाजपेयी के बारे में कहा जाता था वो व्यक्ति तो सही है लेकिन पार्टी गलत है और अटल जी के बाद अगर किसी के लिए कहा जाता है तो वो नितिन गडकरी के लिए कहा जाता है कि बंदा तो सही है लेकिन पार्टी गलत में आ गया है ऐसा क्यों है ये तो बिल्कुल गलत है पार्टी भी सही है और बंदा भी सही है <laughs> मैं मैंने अपने जीवन की शुरुआत संघ के स्वयंसेवक के रूप में और विद्यार्थी परिषद के कार्यकर्ता के रूप में हुई और जो भी मैं आज कुछ जो भी कुछ हूँ जो मेरे में अच्छा ही है ये दोनों संगठन के कारण ही वो सब अच्छा ही है तो आई एम वेरी मच प्राउड ऑफ माई कन्विक्शंस और मैं अगर अच्छा हूँ तो मेरी पार्टी अच्छी है और मैं अगर अच्छा हूँ तो मेरे आइडियोलॉजी अच्छी है इसी यही बात मैं आपको कह सकता हूँ लेकिन आपको नहीं लगता अब राजनीति में गलती से आ गए आप कहते हो मैं पोस्टर नहीं लगवाऊंगा चाय पानी में खर्च नहीं करूँगा तो चुनाव कैसे जीतेंगे गडकरी जी नहीं आप अगर मेरे कॉन्स्टिट्यूंसी में आओगे तो मैंने ये बात कही कि मैं जातीयवाद और सांप्रदायिकता को नहीं मानता हमारे प्रधानमंत्री जी ने कहा है सबका साथ सबका विकास सबका प्रयास तो मैं अपने कॉन्स्टिट्यूंसी में जो मेरे मतदार हैं उनको मैं अपनी फैमिली समझता हूँ परिवार समझता हूँ और दस साल मैंने जो कुछ काम किया उससे मेरा नाम भी लोगों से परिचित हुआ है और मेरा काम भी परिचित हुआ है और इसलिए मैंने कहा कि अब ये पोस्टर बैनर और इसका प्रचार करने की कोई आवश्यकता नहीं दूसरा मैं लोगों के साथ जुड़ा हूं Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. Now shifting focus to some news stories coming in from the world of politics. Now in the state of Bihar, now Rashtriya Lok Janshakti Party Chief Pushpati Paras has resigned from the Modi cabinet after the Paswan faction got five seats in Bihar for the Lok Sabha elections. Now Paras has indicated his displeasure with the NDA and hinted that he might walk out of the alliance. The five seats that went to Chirag Paswan also include Hajipur, the seat that is interestingly. still held by pashupati paras kal vidhivat hai ghoshna ho gaya hum log paanch paanch sat the hamari party mein paanch paanch sat the maine bahut imandari bahut lagan se bafadari se maine anje ki seva ki aaj bhi main mannya pradhan mantri ji ka shukr guzar hu और मैं आज भी वो देश के नेता हैं बड़े नेता हैं लेकिन हमारे पार्टी के साथ और व्यक्तिगत रूप से हमारे साथ नाइंसाफी हुई इसलिए मैं भारत सरकार के कैबिनेट मंत्री से मैं त्याग पत्र देता हूँ More breaking news coming in from the state of Bihar. The, the Rashtriya Lok Samta Party chief Upendra Kushwa has been pacified by the BJP. He will get one Lok Sabha seat, which is Karakat, and he will fight that seat himself. Thus, he will also get one MLC seat, which is vacant. That is the piece of breaking news that's coming in. I'm joined by my colleague Payal Mehta on the broadcast as the rumblings continue in the NDA camp. But it seems Upendra Kushwa has been pacified. Payal, over to you. Uh, well, yes, Kush Upendra Kushwa expressed a lot of displeasure given the fact that he was given just one uh, Lok Sabha seat uh, in the alliance that the BJP really announced from the BJP headquarters yesterday, and even more angry because nobody from his party was really come asked to come and you know represent uh, themselves. 
at the announcement which happened yesterday in the presence of BJP's general secretary and BR in charge, uh, Vinod Tawade. But you know, after that, Vinod Tawade in fact went and met Upendra Kushwa today. Was able to convince Upendra Kushwa that you know he would be pacified. So Upendra Kushwa at the end of the uh, end of it also tweeted and said that he's agreed to be on board as far as the BJP is really concerned, as far as the NDA alliance is really concerned. So he's going to get one vacant MLC seat. His party is going to get one MLC seat. Is what we're given to understand. And Upendra Kushwa has now agreed that he will be ready to fight the Lok Sabha election himself. Remember, Upendra Kushwa was one of those leaders who was part of the Modi government in 1.0. He was, in fact, a minister in the Modi government also in the 1.0 in the first term as well. So, obviously, it's happy homecoming for Upendra Kushwa, who probably has traveled to both sides of the fence, but this time has decided that you, uh, you know, NDA is the side to be on. Right. Thank you, Payal, for getting us that piece of breaking news. So the dynamics continue in the NDA camp in Bihar as it prepares for the Lok Sabha elections. Let's listen into the reactions coming in. But Bihar, Ganga me se kafi pani ab beh chuka hai. Paristitiyan kafi badal gayi hain. Ek baat wo aksar kehte hain. Main manta hu ki hakikat bhi wohi hai. Vikti nahi samay balwan hota. Aur aaj samay ne apni taakat dikhai. समय ने न्याय किया और जस्टिस प्रिवेल किया भाई आने वाले दिनों में मैं हर चुनौती के लिए तैयार हूँ हर चुनौती के लिए मैं तैयार हूँ और ऐसा नहीं कि इससे पहले चुनौतियाँ नहीं आई हैं मेरे जीवन में मैं पिछले तीन सालों से सिर्फ और सिर्फ चुनौतियों का ही सामना कर रहा हूँ तो ऐसे में अगर कोई और चुनौती भी मेरे सामने आती है तो उसका भी उतना ही डट के सामना करूँगा क्योंकि ये विश्वास और पुख्ता हुआ है कि पापा का आशीर्वाद पूरी मजबूती से मेरे साथ है so that's the latest coming in from the state of Bihar and the dynamics in the NDA camp. We're going to take a quick break now. More news and updates on the other side. Ikisi sadi Bharat ki sadi hai. Samasho crore deshvacho ke parisam ke bal par Bharat fastest growing major economy ban gaya. Das varsho me humne apni arthe vyavastha me two trillion dollar aur jod diya. मुझे पूरा विश्वास है भारत पूरी दुनिया के सामने एक मिसाल बन करके उभरेगा वॉच पी एम मोदी शेयर हिस्स थॉट ऑन ड्रीम स्पोर्ट्स प्रेजेंट न्यूज एटीन राइजिंग भारत समेत इन पार्टनरशिप विद हिंदुस्तान टाइम्स नाइनटीन एंड ट्वेंटी मार्च ओनली ऑन न्यूज एटीन नेटवर्क क्यों है ये तो बिल्कुल गलत है पार्टी भी सही है और बंदा भी सही है <laughs> मैं मैंने अपने जीवन की शुरुआत संघ के स्वयंसेवक के रूप में और विद्यार्थी परिषद के कार्यकर्ता के रूप में हुई और जो भी मैं आज कुछ जो भी कुछ हूँ जो मेरे में अच्छा ही है ये दोनों संगठन के कारण ही है वो सब अच्छा ही है तो आई एम वेरी मच प्राउड ऑफ माई कन्विक्शन और मैं अगर अच्छा हूँ तो मेरी पार्टी अच्छी है और मैं अगर अच्छा हूँ तो मेरे आइडियोलॉजी अच्छी है इसी यही बात मैं आपको कह सकता हूँ लेकिन आपको नहीं लगता आप राजनीति में गलती से आ गए आप कहते हो मैं पोस्टर नहीं लगवाऊंगा चाय पानी में खर्च नहीं करूंगा तो चुनाव कैसे जीतेंगे गडकरी जी नहीं आप अगर मेरे कॉन्स्टिट्यूंसी में आओगे तो मैंने ये बात कही कि मैं जातीयवाद और सांप्रदायिकता को नहीं मानता हमारे प्रधानमंत्री जी ने कहा है सबका साथ सबका विकास सबका प्रयास तो मैं अपने कॉन्स्टिट्यूंसी में जो मेरे मतदार हैं उनको मैं अपनी फैमिली समझता हूं परिवार समझता हूं और 10 साल मैंने जो कुछ काम किया उससे मेरा नाम भी लोगों से परिचित हुआ है और मेरा काम भी परिचित हुआ है और इसलिए मैंने कहा कि अब ये पोस्टर बैनर और इसका प्रचार करने की आवश्यकता नहीं दूसरा मैं लोगों के साथ जुड़ा हूँ तो अब मुझे लोगों को किसी प्रकार का कोई उनको वोट के बदले में कुछ उनको सेवा देने की आवश्यकता नहीं है मैं लोगों से मिलूंगा लोगों के घर जाऊंगा पदयात्रा निकालूंगा जो बुजुर्ग लोग हैं उनका आशीर्वाद लूंगा जी और हाउस टू हाउस और मैन टू मैन कैंपेन करूंगा और मेरा विश्वास है कि मैं अच्छे मार्जिन से चुनाव जीतूंगा ऐसा मेरा विश्वास इस बार तीन हैट्रिक लगनी है एक तो मोदी सरकार की हैट्रिक एक नरेंद्र मोदी अगर इस टर्म में आते हैं तो बहुत बड़ी बात होगी कोई गैर कांग्रेसी सरकार तीसरी बार पहली बार आएगी दूसरी बार भी पहली बार आई थी और तीसरा नागपुर से आप दोबारा जीत कर आएंगे तीसरी बार जीत कर आएंगे तो कितनी कठिन या डगर लगती है मोदी की तीसरी टर्म 
और आपका तीसरी बार लोकसभा जीतना देखिए पहली बात तो मोदी जी प्रधानमंत्री बनने ही वाले हैं ये तय है दूसरी बात यह है कि हम 400 पार जाने वाले ये भी तय है जी और मैं भी चुनाव जीतने वाला हूं ये भी निश्चित है ये भी <laughs> लेकिन नितिन गडकरी में ऐसा क्या है कि विपक्ष के नेता मुरीद हो जाते हैं मैं पीछे अखबार में पढ़ रहा था कि सोनिया गांधी ने आपकी तारीफ कर दी ऐसा क्या है देखिए ये मुझे भी आश्चर्य है क्योंकि पार्लियामेंट में जब मेरे डिपार्टमेंट पर पचहत्तर सांसद बोले अलग अलग पार्टी के सबने मुझे धन्यवाद दिया सबने अभिनंदन किया तो मुझे भी आश्चर्य लगा तो एक तो सीधी बात यह है कि जो कानूनी काम है नियम के अनुसार है वो सबका होना चाहिए और गलत काम होगा तो अपने का भी नहीं होना चाहिए तो मैं रोड बनाता हूँ तो एक कॉन्स्टिट्यूशन में रोड बनाऊँ और दूसरों को छोड़ दूँ ऐसा तो नहीं होता तो जो भी लोग मेरे पास समस्या लेकर आते हैं मैंने सबका काम करने का प्रयास किया तो उसके कारण उनके मन में उसका समाधान है यही शायद उसका कारण होगा एक चीज जो आप में नहीं बदली There is he's on us. Every every team in Visa is expected to have a roadmap and a plan of how they're using generative AI to make their function more more effective and more efficient. Finance, HR, products, obviously technology. So the use technology. case at this point in time, efficiency and effectiveness, right? So it, it is. It's about efficiency and effectiveness. But I think the real magic, the real magic is when we're able to bring new products to market using generative AI. I, I'll give you an example. Um, we uh, we have been using generative AI to take our transaction data and create what we call synthetic data sets. And what we're able to do with synthetic data sets is take the same fraud, risk, and cyber capabilities yeah. we've used on the Visa network and use those to identify fraud on real-time payment networks. And we found that we can identify scams and fraud using the same data and analytics from our experience in in card payments. And apply that to account-to-account -account payments and real-time payments, all because we have generative AI to create these new synthetic data sets and these new analytic tools. You know, let me just stick with that. Given what's happening in the Indian fintech space, specifically on the startup side, is that is that something that you're looking at closely? Does anything excite you there? Are we likely to see you fund anything on that side? Yeah, we've um, we've been. First of all, what I, what's happened in India in the fintechs and startup space is extraordinary. Um, we partner with most, if not all, of them to help them. Uh, we've invested in uh, several of them here in India. I'm looking for more generative AI commerce uh, companies. So if you find any as part of this conference, please let me know. We're looking to invest in them. That that's that's the pitch. So if anyone's watching this, the global CEO of Visa is on the lookout. Uh, for Indian fintechs who are focused on the generative AI space. Hopefully you'll start to get a lot of people writing into you, Ryan. That would, that would, that would make me extremely happy. <laughs> well, you know, uh, since we're talking about fintech, let's talk about regulation in India. Uh, the regulator has done many things, uh, including data localization, which was brought in a couple of years ago. Of course, all of you need to be compliant with that. There have been some recent changes for credit cards specifically. How do you see the regulatory environment in India at this point in time? Is it challenging? Does it add friction? Or is it making you feel that it is securing the digital payment ecosystem? Of course, it can be challenging at times, but it makes us better. Uh, that's how we view it. We want to be in compliance as effective and faster than any company in our space. We want the regulators to look at Visa as a leader. Uh, and we lean into this regulation because we do believe that it makes us better. I also give enormous credit to the regulators in India for leading the charge on innovations that not only um, make the, the system more safe, they help drive commerce. I would use uh, tokenization as an example. I think the regulators in India leaned into tokenization, they mandated tokenization, and as a result, e-commerce is going to be adopted even faster in India. It's going to be safer, it's going to be more secure, it's going to have higher authorization So you're saying rates. that the regulator in India was uh, ahead of the curve on tokenization? Absolutely. They were an innovator in that way of leading, it, it, as far as all the regulators in the world, by mandating tokenization for e-commerce in India. Mm -hmm. uh, so what would you say are the key risks today? Uh, you know, what keeps you up at night? You were talking about uh, cyber safety, cyber security, and in general, what we've seen with 
the um, momentum of digital transactions going up, that we've also seen the risks of digital fraud, of cyber risks, and so on and so forth. How are you, uh, A, within Visa, uh, trying to fortify yourself, and how much of this is a risk that you're factoring in? It's, a, it's an enormous priority for us. I think it's a very big risk. You know, at the core of digital payments, at the core of the success of digital payments, is trust. All of us are very comfortable engaging in digital payments, whether it's with a Visa card or anything else, because we trust that it's going to be safe. And we take the responsibility to safeguard our network and ensure that it's the safest and most reliable network very seriously. As you might expect, we're a very big target for uh, the bad guys that are out there. Um, we have somewhere between... Average, how, how much do you get attacked in a day? I was just about to say, we, we are attacked somewhere between 400 and 500 million times a month. Attack vectors that come from all different parts of the world. I'll give you another, another example. Uh, as a, we have about 30,000 employees. Every month, we stop 20 million emails that were meant to be sent to our employees, and we stop them before they get to them. All of those are from bad actors. They're trying to trick our employees into doing something that they otherwise shouldn't do. Um, so we take that very seriously. We've invested billions in our cybersecurity protections. We have a thousand people that come into work every day, and all they do is focus on our cyber protections. But beyond that, we're also creating tools for our bank partners mm. to help them stop fraud. Yeah. Every year, through those tools, we stop more than $30 billion of fraud that otherwise would have been perpetrated on our network and with our, our customers' clients. So this is, is, this is going to be an arms race. It's going to continue to be an arms race, and we are going to invest, and we're going we're gonna to work as hard as we possibly can to stay one step, if not five steps ahead of the bad actors to ensure that the network is as safe and as secure as it possibly can be. You know, when you say that this is going to be an arms race, explain to me uh, how you're going about it. I mean, putting money at the problem or throwing money at the problem is just one aspect, but how are you thinking about this strategically? And more importantly, how do you look at this from your partner's perspective as well, who may not, be, may not have the ability to throw money at the problem? Well, first on the second part of your question, this is something I've been talking to um, everyone that I've had a chance to meet with while I've been in India. We want to protect our network, the Visa network, with all of the tools and security that I mentioned, but we also want to make these tools available to all networks. We want to make our services available to any, any network that's out there because, let's be honest, like all of the, the network of networks that we operate in across the world, um, and on this particular topic, we're all in this together. Mm. We need to be investing in the safety and security of digital payments so that everybody across the world continues to trust. So MasterCard and you are aligned on this one. I, listen, <laughs> I, I, I think cyber protection is existential for digital payments, and so I want to make sure that we're making our products, our services, our talent, we're sharing information, we're sharing our services to anyone that's interested in putting them to work, and you know, we feel like we have great uh, products and services that we can be helpful with. Yeah, I want to go back to something that you said right at the very beginning. You said that you're here in India to learn. Uh, and in the context of the digital public infrastructure and what India has been able to do with the India stack, it was a big part of our pitch to the world uh, through our G20 presidency as well. What do you see as the opportunities to export the India stack to the world? Yeah, I, first of all, I think the world is paying very close attention to it. I think there is a meaningful opportunity to export the stack. Uh, I mean, you just you go through it. Aadhaar, UPI, um, ONDC, DigiLocker. I mean, all of these elements of the stack are extraordinarily impressive. I was saying to, to my team the other day, I think if you look at what India has done, and you look at the product roadmap, I would put it up against any of the best big tech players on the planet. Not just the roadmap itself, um, the clarity, the execution, the, the, the transparency, um, the length of the roadmap. Um, it, is, it is remarkable execution, and I think there is a big opportunity to export uh, the stack uh, far beyond India. Well, what do you think it will take for us to be able to do that in terms of prioritization, in terms of strategic choices? You know, if, if you were to sort of uh, put together a roadmap of how we take it forward, what would that entail? I, I think at a foundation is uh, public-private partnership. 
um, you know, we view ourselves as a potential partner. Um, and, you know, I think what's, what's proven, if you look over time, with the adoption of uh, similar types of things around the world, it's the public-private partnership at work. And, you know, I think this is an area where uh, India's leadership, as you said, coming out of the G20, um, making the world more aware of the stack and the impact that it's had um, is a big first step. And, you know, I think engaging with governments, engaging with the private sector, companies like Visa, and through public-private partnership, that should be a great way to expand those things. Let's talk about what's happening globally as well, Ryan. Uh, clearly, you're confident about the India growth story, the macros, as well as what's happening as far as the digital side of the story is concerned. But global, uh, you know, the, the uh, macros continue to look challenging at this point in time. The expectation of a cut coming in from the Fed in June, perhaps less likely today. Japan's just raised interest rates. What are consumer trends telling you in terms of spending power, spending capacity, and the possibility of uh, the current trends holding up? Despite everything that you said, the consumer spending around the world remains resilient. It remains stable. I mean, you look at the year-over-year -year growth in transactions or payment volume uh, across our network and in most of the countries in which we operate, uh, it's been relatively stable. That's a really good news, despite mm. everything you said. Now, of course, higher interest rates are, are, are taking a dent out of consumers. Um, consumers are changing their purchasing patterns, uh, the mix of buying? things they buy. What, what are they spending most of their money on today? Well, it's, it's actually coming uh, now having, um, with COVID a couple of years in the rearview mirror, uh, we've rebalanced pretty close to where we were in the mix of goods and services pre-COVID with a bit more shift towards services, travel, entertainment, yeah. Taylor Swift concerts, <laughs> uh, things like that. Um, so I think that's, a whole, that's a whole other economy, we, isn't it? The Taylor it, Swift economy is a whole other economy. It's incredible, isn't it? <laughs> it's incredible. Um, but you know, going back to your first question, it, the consumer remains resilient. Listen, there, there's, there's pockets around the world. Um, in some markets where, for example, you've got more variable rate mortgages. Australia is a good example. UK is a good example. Consumers are having to spend more of their discretionary spending or non-discretionary spending on, on mortgages, and we see that coming out of spending. But on the other side, um, we see travel in and out of China picking up. We see travel uh, into the United States picking up. So international travel um, is, is very much still on the rebound. So overall stable with some, some puts and takes in different places. You know, you talked about uh, regional differences in the way that uh, resilience is showing up. And, and you're on your way out of India, you're, you're going to be headed into China. So let's address that issue as well. Uh, the recovery is underway, but patchy. Uh, there are concerns on what is happening as far as the real estate sector in China is concerned and whether that poses a systemic risk. How do you see China at this point in time, both in terms of recovery as well as in terms of consumer confidence? Yeah, um, in, in terms of China, we, again, we think about it in five, 10 year, 15 year increments. Uh, there's no question that you know, the Chinese economy is going through some bumps right now, but there too, we view it as our role to be as helpful as we possibly can, um, to invest in the tools and the capabilities to help the, the banks and the broader economy do well. Um, and you know, China's a, a very large economy with a lot of power, and I think when you think five, 10, and 15 years out, uh, it's gonna be a big opportunity as well. So as a global CEO, what, what, what do you map on your dashboard? I mean, outside of what's happening inside of Visa, what are the factors that uh, you have on your dashboard as potential risks or potential opportunities today? Geopolitics has, of course, emerged as one of the big concerns, given just the volatile state of play. But uh, you know, what are you looking at? What are the various factors that you're looking at? Yeah, this, this, I mean, um, geopolitics is always an issue. You and I were talking beforehand about the, the enormous number of elections that are happening this year. So from that, there's going to be change. There's always change. Um, but, you know, I, I'm very optimistic, very optimistic of the opportunities around the world. Um, you know, coming out of the elections, I think there's enormous kind of road in front of us. And you know, I'm hopeful that the economy can continue to have the great success that it has. And, you know, hopefully we can be a, a part of that. You know, the other thing that I spend a lot of time on is consumer preferences, consumer trends. What are, what are we hearing from buyers and sellers around the world? What do they need? What are the technologies that are changing, um, you know, how they're running their businesses or they're engaging in, in their lives? Uh, by the way, generative AI, um, another topic we could talk about that's helpful is how I think it's going to change shopping, which mm. I think it'll have a very big impact More on More experiential? That. Yeah, I think... Um, it's, you know, it's just going to make it easier. 
you know, if you think about um, shopping, for, especially for someone like myself, who's neither that good at it nor likes it that much, um, it's very inefficient. That, that makes the two of us. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's relatively inefficient. Um, and so I think generative AI, all of us are going to have co-pilots in terms of shopping. We're going to have much more curated experiences. We're going to have much more curated payment experiences that come with it. Um, and that's just going to make a much better experience. I, I also think um, I have a personal thesis that generative AI could be a very empowering capability for small businesses around the world. Mm. It starts to give them access to the capabilities that only the largest retailers have had, whether it's product reviews mm. or recommendation engines or things like that become unbundled and available to small and medium businesses around the world. I think generative AI could be a very leveling force in the that commerce space. You, you preempted what I was going to say. So you actually believe the generative AI will level the playing field, not make the gaps wider? I believe it will. That's my personal thesis. I think, um, I think it'll, it'll, for the largest retailers and the largest platforms, it will certainly help optimize what they do. Um, and it, again, make a more enjoyable experience for all of us as shoppers. Uh, but I think it has the power to level the playing field. It has the power to democratize a lot of the commerce capabilities that have been bundled into some of the largest platforms and make them available. And for you and I as shoppers, I think we're going to have much more broad views to inventory that's available in small and medium businesses, either in the cities that we live in or, or around us. Mm -hmm. You know, so who do you consider as competition today in a fintech world, in an AI-led world where every phone company wants to be a fintech player, uh, you know, every big tech company wants to be in the banking business as well in some shape or form or in the payments business? What, what does the competitive landscape look like today for you? I'll tell you, over the last several years, um, you know, the, the, the early narrative on fintechs was, you know, th they're going to be competitive for the payment system. We saw it differently. We saw all of these players as potential partners. And that's very much how we see it today. FinTech, Big Tech, Little Tech, Small Tech. We view all of them as potential partners for Visa. And we view it as an opportunity to put our network to work to help them grow their business and ultimately meet whatever goal it is that they've set out for themselves. And I think uh, if you go today, for example, down in, in Silicon Valley near where I live, and you talk to FinTechs, you'll find most, if not all of them, Visa has become their most important partner. And so that, that's, that's how we see the world. We see the world um, in terms of partners and people that we can put our network to work, open our network, make it available, and help them achieve whatever it is the goal that they're trying to achieve. You know, you said that uh, uh, you see fintechs as potential collaborators, potential partners as well. You also said earlier on that Perhaps in the future, at some point, you may just drop card altogether as part of the sort of proposition that you offer to consumers because you know, you're digital in, in many ways. So what do you see Visa being? I mean, in terms of your core DNA, how do you see that core DNA evolving and changing given the many uh, changes that we are seeing in the ecosystem? What could that potentially mean over the next five to 10 years? Yeah, at our core, we're a network. We're the safest, most secure, most reliable, largest payment network on the planet with the largest reach. And the way we're evolving that is building out from not just being the Visa network to being a network of networks. And that's what we want to do. We want to be able to enable money movement across all networks around the, the, the world. Um, you know, we were talking about remittances and that Visa Direct platform that, that I mentioned to you earlier, we move money across ACH systems we move money across RTP systems. We move money across other card networks. Again, all in service of giving our clients the biggest, most reliable, safest, most secure money movement platform on the planet. So that, that's how we think about our role. And we, we very much are an open network. We want anyone to build on us. Whatever they can dream up, the products, the services that they can dream up, they know that they have the Visa network available to them to put their products and services to work. So do you see India then being an incubator of some of the innovations that you would hope for Visa to focus on in the future? An innovator, an exporter, um, there's no question about it. I mean, the fintech community here has had a very profound impact on Visa. Um, and, you know, we've, we've collaborated, we've worked with them. How has it changed Visa? How, how have Indian fintechs changed Visa? Yeah, Indian fintechs have opened up our mind to the power of QR payments. So.
Because we just came up with the word just like that. Shantanu, right now. what is art fluids? Uh, okay. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Shantanu Hazarika, and I am an artist by profession. And there's no such thing as art fluids. I mean, art has always been influential throughout the ages. We have read about the different movements in art du during the Renaissance time, during all different periods of time. But what is art in its truest form? It's a summary, it's a sort of a subjective understanding of any civilization. And it is always propagated through different mediums. Before it was through sculptures, before it was through portraits, paintings, and now it's through social media. So what, what I'm trying to do is uh, merge the uh, idea of art, get it out there for a wider audience to understand and perceive art how we artists see them as, basically. So art fluencing, to be honest, is still a very subjective term. We just coined it. We're going to trademark this. And what I'm trying to do is create a design and introduce a quality or set a bar when it comes to art and design through social media. Right. My first question is to Janvi. Janvi, if you guys uh, don't know already, was awarded the fashion icon with a heritage touch from the Prime Minister himself. You must have seen that very famous, yes, please, come on, don't be shy. You must have seen that meme where Janvi went uh, in her mode and tried to touch Prime Minister's feet. The Prime Minister reciprocated and touched her feet instead. And she, like this 20-year-old that she is, she doesn't look it, all shy, has lots to say about that. So Janvi, by the way, for all of you who don't know, is just 20. And on her, on her page, the content that she speaks about is on saris, different kind of saris, where they come from, and in that mode, tell you a little bit about culture, tell you a little bit about heritage of India. Isn't that quite beautiful? So Janvi, firstly, welcome, and tell Thank us, uh, how did it all really start? Sari, is this sari fluencer? Can I call you that? Like, is that a phrase now? Yeah, I think you can call me that, and I would love to be, <laughs> right? So I think, uh, I mean, fashion is subjective, but I think that fashion is to your culture and your heritage, ko represent karna, if I can represent my state or any other particular state in Bharat. And I think Bharat is such a beautiful country, there are so beautiful textiles, hai, prints, hai, and sometimes it's going to be lost, it's going to be lost, right? So there are a common prints, right? Uh, a lot of us know Banarasi and then Paitri and uh, maybe Patora. But uh, there are few more textiles that people don't know. There is Ikat, Ajrak, like Kosa, Mekhla. So these prints are not in Bharat. And my love for the sari is very much. And I thought that if I am so interested in this, uh, you know, to know about the textile and the culture. So, aise bahut sare log honge. So, I thought let's start a series and even I'll get to learn ki Bharat mein kitni alag alag saris hai. Ek sari ko banne mein kitna samay lagta hai, kitni valuable hai. Kyunki agar hum itihas mein bhi jaake dekhe, because uh, main content banate ho, to mera content scriptures ke around bhi hota hai, right? So, Mahabharat mein bhi agar hum jaake dekhe, to Maa Draupati, और महाभारत के समय में मारुकमणि ये भी हुई थी शुरू ही हुई थी तो ये सभ्यता कितनी पुरानी है है ना तो वहां से ये शुरू हुई एंड देन इट केम टू रामायण आल्सो जहां माता सीता माता कौशल्या भी हैंडलूम पर बने हुए हाथ शाल हाथ शिल्प पर बनी हुई सिल्क की रेशम की साड़ियां पहना करती थी सो आई वांट टू रिवाइव कल्चर बैक इन इंडिया एंड टू रिप्रेजेंट साड़ी प्राउडली सो दिस इज द न्यू कूल द न्यू कूल सी यू गेटिंग अप्लॉज स्ट्रेट अवे ऑन दैट सो you know, when I met Janvi and I said, when you meet a 20-year-old influencer, what is the image that comes to mind? Clearly not this, but it's people like Janvi who are changing trends, who are making India cool, who are making content which is about India, rooted in India, so much cooler. I think that's why we're having this conversation right here on the Rising Bharat Summit as well. So we talked about sari influence there is also travel influencing our next guest on the panel unke naam kya gaya aapne dekha hoga bruised passports likha hai usko usi naam se jaane jate hain 
और हम जब इनसे बात कर रहे थे तो ये वैसे तरह के लोग हैं जिनको आप सोशल अपने स्क्रोल पर देखते हैं सोशल मीडिया पर और कहते हैं ये हमेशा ट्रैवल करते रहते हैं काम कब करते हैं सो वी रियली वॉन्ट टू अंडरस्टैंड फ्रॉम द टू ऑफ यू काम कब करते हैं हर समय ट्रैवल करते हैं ये लाइफ है और कैसे हर समय वेकेशन पर होते हैं um, हमको ट्रैवलिंग इतनी अच्छी लगती है कि हमने उसे अपना काम भी बना लिया है तो अब हम ट्राई करते हैं कि काम भी कर ले और पैशन भी फॉलो कर ले बट आई ट्रूली थिंक दैट द द रीजन व्हाई वी स्टार्टेड डूइंग दिस वाज बिकॉज बोथ ऑफ आस हैव नोन ईच अदर फॉर सदी सदी भारत की सदी है। समाजों करोड़ देशवासियों के परिश्रम के बल पर भारत फास्टेस्ट ग्रोइंग मेजर इकोनॉमी बन गया दस वर्षों में हमने अपनी अर्थव्यवस्था में टू ट्रिलियन डॉलर और जोड़ दिया मुझे पूरा विश्वास है भारत पूरी दुनिया के सामने एक मिसाल बन करके उभरेगा Watch PM Modi share his thoughts on Dream Sports presents News 18 Rising Bharat Summit in partnership with Hindustan Times 19th and 20th March only on News 18 network earlier in the first part of the answer you said why do parties align with each other they want to win elections they want to change the electoral map so is it that bjp needs bjd more or bjd needs bjp more it, uh, bjp doesn't need uh, B, bjd doesn't need bjp to form government in the state and bjp may not need bjd to form government in the center that's why i made it very clear that it is to do with two individuals who share a great friendship amongst each other and they see some things are beyond politics and that is where you see a rare mark of uh, statesmanship i consciously use the word statesmanship it is nothing to do with politics it's beyond politics so so where is the status of that alliance right now because pm came i think earlier this month he pra- praised navin patnaik as a lokpriya neta but we haven't heard anything ever since i think if anything happens we'll all get to know <laughs> No, no, that's why I'm asking you. No, no, better to ask I, than you. We'll all get to know if something happens. But I, I, I told the logic behind this. Whatever talk has happened, also I told the logic behind. It has nothing of electoral significance either to Odisha or to the country. It is more to do with statesmanship. Tell us a little bit more about your guru, your father figure. I mean, he will. And by the middle of this year become the longest ever serving chief minister in the history of india he's already gone past jyoti basu i think he'll go past pawan chamling by the middle of this year it has never happened in the history of india and you have seen first hand why it has happened or what makes him tick so tell us I what think, is the success uh, of his longevity here is a chief minister who is so popular in the state and he gets 3/4 majority every time mr navin patnaik the recently concluded panchayat elections he won simple election it's based on party symbol he won 90% of the seats and uh, the second party was 5% seats bjp so mr navin patnaik doesn't need an alliance to come back to serve the people he doesn't need an alliance i bjp I, needs I, an alliance no i would say the same thing about mr narendra modi the honorable prime minister of india whatever surveys you are showing whatever others are showing that he is going to become the prime minister of the country mr navin patnaik is going to the chief minister of the state undoubtedly and mr navin mr narendra modi is going to be the prime minister how i put it is it is beyond there are some things beyond politics it is a mark of great statesmanship that's how i put it that two great leaders wanting to come together for a greater cause it 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 has it has it has significance as two two great uh, people coming together as as a mark of statesmanship it has nothing to do with politics
2014 elections where she took the fight to Rahul Gandhi in Amethi but most importantly when she won that historic contest in 2019. She was given charge of the high profile HRD ministry later, the information and broadcasting ministry, textiles and now the women and child development and minority affairs. It's such a pleasure to have you ma'am. Please welcome Srimati Smriti Zubin Irani, the Honourable Minister of Women and Child Development and Minority Affairs. In conversation with my colleague Anand. Namaste everybody, are you all awake? It's Ms. Uh, Smriti Zubin Irani in the house. You, she deserves a bigger round of applause and welcome. So let's just... Thank you very much for gracing Rising Bharat. We're talking about a Viksit Bharat at uh, 2047. Smriti ji, I just want to read out something which has just come fresh off the uh, coals, if I may say that. Uh, this is what is being said. In a time of high unemployment, rising prices, corruption and oppression, Rahul Gandhi is the only hope for 1.35 billion Indians dedicated to 